Okay. Um, yeah, thank you all for, for being here. Um, so my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at University of Toronto. Um, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to present this paper as it has nothing to do with my dissertation. Uh, so this is a side project. Um, I'm also not a historian by training, I'm a philosopher, um, specifically philosophy of science. So um, I'm looking forward to constructive feedback on this. Um, so my talk is on the history of econophysics. And some of you may have heard of econophysics as a very heterodox uh, contemporary discipline. Um, so my attempt is to try to trace the historical origins of this. And um, mainstream accounts of the history of this uh, that have been published recently, the past 10 years or so, have um, tracked it in the history of physics and finance. But I try to argue that there's some sense in which history of economic thought, mainstream economics, um, has something to say about this history as well. Um, so first, I give a brief overview of the historiography, um, and then I go into Jevons, Fisher, and Edgeworth as contributing to some of the methods in contemporary econophysics. So ostensibly, econophysics is just a portmanteau composed of economics and physics. Well, not exactly, because it's not straightforwardly economics, nor is it straightforwardly physics. So here's a quote from one recent textbook on econophysics. We might imagine the physicist to be in the engine room helping drive a ship, whereas the economist is the captain on the bridge. Econophysics seeks not to displace economics, rather it aims to help economists find deeper understandings of complex systems with a large number of degrees of freedom. So econophysics displays an explicit case of physics transfer. Um, so that is the usage reference to or drawing of analogy from physics's methodology to the study of economic phenomena. So some examples, some of which I'll go over throughout my talk, are these log periodic power laws in condensed matter physics uh, for the analysis of stock market crashes, and the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution uh, in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics for monetary dynamics. Um, so one example of which uh, was partly touched on through Q&A uh, earlier uh, was the Paul Ehrenfest and Jan Tinbergen connection. Um, so Marcel Bellmans has his paper on Hamiltonians and the adiabatic, excuse me, adiabatic method for analyzing business cycles. Um, so that's an example of more modest physics transfer. Econophysics is far more radical than this. Um, so, you know, the usage of physics analogies goes back to at least 18th century, if not before. Um, so Say and Yenard, for example, are two figures discussed by Ingrao and Israel in their book, The Invisible Hand. Um, we have Leon Walras, of course, who also discusses some of this in the general equilibrium models that he tries to develop. And we have um, astronomers like Adolf Ketelet, um, who is famous especially in the history of statistics, um, and uh, some work in criminology as well. He has this idea of the average man. And so there's a lot of figures at this time in the 19th century who are also interested in applying um, methods in physics to understand uh, social phenomena. Okay, so what is this econophysics thing? So currently there's some disagreements as to how to demarcate the boundaries of the discipline. Um, one recent paper describes econophysics as a relative autarky. The basic idea is this. One, econophysics has been criticized for misapplying the methods of physics to economic phenomena. So this is a philosopher of physics, Dean Rickles, writing. Um, we have the claim that econophysics is continuous with physics in some sense, such as that, to quote one paper, in the period following a large crash, markets show lingering activity which follows the famous Omori law for earthquake aftershocks. Another view says that dialogue between econophysicists and financial eco e economists is almost non-existent. Okay. So one history paper says that econophysics did not become a significant sub-discipline of economics until the late 1990s. Um, so there's some bibliographic data here. So post-1995 data from the journal Physical Review, published by the American Physical Society, in which the term market does not appear in this journal until 1999 and with the terms physics not appearing in the journals Econometrica until 2001, and the term econophysics until as late as 2005. But they do appear in these journals. Uh, James Weatherall at UC Irvine, uh, he has a book called The Physics of Wall Street, and he describes econophysics as a core component of the history of finance rather than history of mainstream economic thought. Uh, we have Jovanovic, Jovanovic and Shinkus, um, who wrote a paper on this, and they say the extension of physics to the study of problems generally considered as falling within the sphere of economics 
suggesting its closer affinity to the history of physics rather than that of economics. Okay. So my paper tries to argue uh, for these three claims. Uh, econophysics has reasonably clear enough boundaries such that its origins can be traced in some sense. Uh, second is that there's little that is substantially novel about contemporary econophysics with respect to the history of economic thoughts ideas. Third is that econophysics ought to be properly understood as a continuation of the history of economic thought proper. So econophysics can be defined as data first positivist methodology. Rather than a priori theorizing and seek to distance themselves from contemporary mainstream economists and their close attention to the empirical adequacy of their formal models. Uh, so this is an old debate. You know, economists have had debates about this for a long time. So Mark Blaug has a great book on this. Um, the 30 year period from 1871 to 1896, um, so more like 25 year period, but uh, witnessed the rise in three key econophysical concepts. We have, of course, physical analogies for economic phenomena conservation principles, and scaling laws. So despite being heterodox, econophysics is nonetheless concerned to explain economic phenomena. And I have in parentheses here Robbins and Mill, insofar as Robbins said, uh, economics is concerned with the scarce allocation, sorry, the allocation of scarce resources amongst competing uses. Um, and Mill being concerned with um, nature and inquiry into causes of wealth. Okay, so William Stanley Jevons is the first of three figures that I'll describe. So for Jevons, what is economics? The causes and effects of man's industry and shows how it may best be applied. Um, so he's one of the first to use differential and integral calculus um, to measure changes in the hedonic mental states of economic agents. So these differential equations can be constructed modeling larger social systems containing multiple agents, so on and so forth. The economist's role is to posit imperfect, inductive, and probabilistic economic laws. This is specifically in his theory of political economy in 1871. Since we cannot measure the exact happenings in the minds of each individual consumer, and he has many passages in which he tries to argue for this, the best we can do is to look at the aggregate behavior of individuals insofar as they constitute populations. So what is indeterminate at the micro scale may become more determinate in a more macro scale. Uh, Jevons thought that economics is very similar to astronomy in some sense, analyzing aggregates of data, inferring causal relations, checking against social reality. So here's a quote from a sequence of letters and journals that um, I believe it was his sister, uh, Harriet Jevons, uh, collected after his death. Um, economy, scientifically speaking, is a sort of vague mathematics which calculates the causes and effects of man's industry and is analogous to the connections of mechanics, astronomy, and every other branch of physical science with pure mathematics. Econophysics, similarly, uses probability statistics and inductive methods and consider them to be central. So to quote one econophysics uh, paper, economists consider that price changes obey a log normal probability distribution with a kurtosis around zero. This is a priori, sorry, this a priori perspective implies that massive fluctuations are very unlikely. However, the real data have a leptokurtic distribution in which extreme events have a greater probability. So the idea here is that the usage of inductive and statistical methods and its close attention to detail to actual prices um, is supposed to um, challenge some of the central assumptions of economists. This is the claim of this particular paper. Uh, going back to Jevons, there is really no process of reasoning which enables us to infer from observed to unobserved cases unless it be the calculus of probabilities. So he would employ some statistical concepts, such as the use of averages, um, method of least squares. I mean, it's not clear to what extent he really employed the method of least squares in this sense, but um, there is almost no question that Jevons regarded mathematics as the means to elevate the scientific status of economics in direct imitation of the physical sciences. This is from Margaret Chabas, who is a Jevons scholar. Some more Jevons quotes here. The deductive science of economics must be verified and rendered useful by the purely empirical science of statistics. I believe all the sciences must meet somewhere. No part of knowledge can stand wholly disconnected. Uh, this is from other parts of the universe of thought. Okay. The causes in action in any community, so far as we can analyze this, the statistical phenomena observed, we obtain a verification of our reasoning. The theory here given in the theory of political economy. 
may be described as the mechanics of utility and self-interest. Its method is as sure as and demonstrative as that of kinematics or statics. Nay, almost as self-evident as are the elements of Euclid. So he's making quite a number of strong claims here. And the, the connection to physics is arguably quite clear here. So here's another quote from a uh, contemporary quantum physics paper. The bulk of the income distribution is well described by a Gibbs distribution or a log normal distribution. This seems to be a universal feature. From ancient Egyptian society through 19th century Europe to modern Japan, from the advanced capitalist economy of the US to the developing economy of India. Okay, so that summarizes the key points I wanted to make about Jevons for now. Um, so I want to move on to Irving Fisher. Um, so for, for those who have taken a bit of physics, uh, you know about conservation principles. They are key to the history of physics. Uh, for econophysics, um, thermodynamics is one of the kind of key methodological entry points into the discipline. Uh, so Murawski, of course, has this famous book, uh, More Heat Than Light, and he claims that it was Helmholtz's formulation of the conservation of energy in particular that led to the idea that value, exchange and use, was a conserved substance. Okay, so before I get to Fisher, I want to just go into a bit more detail about a contemporary econophysics model that uses conservation principles. So we have Viktor Yakovenko, who is currently at University of Maryland's physics department, and he's very active. Um, so he says this in one paper. He says, as an undergraduate in the 1970s in Moscow, while conservation laws in physics follow from fundamental space-time symmetries, conservation of money is the law of accounting. So he would read this 10-volume course of theoretical physics uh, by these uh, Soviet physicists and led him to believe that the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution of energy in physics, um, where P of epsilon is the probability that a given particle in a thermodynamic system has energy level epsilon, C a constant, E Euler's number, and T the temperature, could be related to monetary theory. So you might ask, what is going on here? You know, what is the connection that he sees? So as Yakovenko writes, <laughs> This mathematical derivation should be applicable to a much broader class of systems which have nothing to do with physics as long as they are statistical ensembles and have a conserved variable. I thought of the economy, which is surely a big statistical ensemble with millions of interacting agents, but is there a conserved variable? Ordinary economic agents can only receive and give money to other agents but are not permitted to manufacture money. This would be criminal counterfeiting. This is what he says. Okay, so here's the, the, the model in a bit more detail here. So let n be the number of people in an economy. Each person, p sub i, has m sub p sub i, amounts of money. Let m be the sum total of all the money in the economy. And suppose that everyone in the economy has the same amount of money. I mean, these are very specific assumptions, of course, this model, that are questionable. Assume that the following dynamics apply to this economy, where a single iteration of the system involves, first, randomly picking two actors. One is a buyer, the other is a seller where each has the same probability of having a given role, that is, being the buyer or the seller. Second, randomly pick a price P for the transaction within the interval zero to X, where X is the total amount of money of any given buyer at the time. Third, the buyer's new money amount is X minus P after the iteration is complete. So in a textbook on econophysics, the claim is that such a process, if iteratively applied, follows the following Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, which is what we saw above in the Yakovenko example. That is, the probability of person P sub I having the amount of money M is proportional to an exponential function of the amount of money. So the intuition is that the probability that someone has a lot of money is lower the higher the given amount of money is. Okay? But the crucial assumption here is that money is supposed to be conserved quantity of some kind. Okay, so how does, how does Fisher have anything to do with this? Um, so Fisher's PhD thesis was supervised by Josiah Willard Gibbs, you know, famous engineer and physicist, and William Graham Summer, who is a sociologist. Uh, in his dissertation, which was eventually published as the Mathematical Investigation in the Theory of Value and Price, conservation of society's resources is manifested through utility rather than money, one of the main themes in the book. Inspired by Hume's aquatic analogies with cistern models featuring throughout his dissertation. So cisterns are kind of like these vessels of liquid. So in his dissertation, Fisher was very critical of the psychological concept of utility in Jevons and Edgeworth. Uh, to quote from his dissertation, this foisting of psychology and economics seems to me inappropriate and vicious. 
Instead, you want to focus on objective commodity relations and the notion of desire. So we do not always value exchanging commodities for their pleasure or displeasure, but perhaps out of duty or a general preference satisfaction in some sense. This is why he wants to focus on desire as opposed to pleasure and pain. Econophysicists similarly reject or supplant utility analyses. So we have some quotes here. Economic science may also have a type of Heisenberg inequality because some microeconomic parameters like utility are not observable directly. Um, putting aside how questionable I think that claim is, but among other things here. Um, another quote here, the economic entropy that we introduce should be seen as a well-founded replacement for what is called production or utility function in neoclassical economics. The entropy function may be used to find the optimal number of different professionals in a company, the best choice of different commodities in a household, the best choice of stocks or bonds in a portfolio. In neoclassical economics, this function is called the utility function. Okay, so going back to Fisher again. So what is Fisher's idea in this dissertation? Well, first postulate is that each individual, each individual acts as he or she desires. So if the desire for commodity A is greater than or equal to that of the desire for B, then the utility of A is going to be greater than or equal to that of B. Desirability can be quantified by comparing an individual's purchasing behavior. That is the utility, um, the, the, the ratio of the utility can equal some number. Uh, the marginal utility is defined as the differential of the utility function in this sense. Um, and then we have definitions for total utility for consuming and net gain from consuming as well. Um, so Fisher makes a number of assumptions in this model. First, that there's a market large enough so that individual consumers cannot unilaterally alter the price, the commodity. There's a given, period, a given time period of analysis, for example, a year. The rate of production and consumption in the period are equal. Each individual knows all prices. Each commodity is infinitely divisible. And marginal utility decreases as the amount consumed increases. OK, so then the mechanism. So consider a cistern of water drawn as a kind of rectangular prism. So this appears throughout his dissertation for those who haven't had the chance to look at it. It's really interesting to look at these little diagrams that he has. In fact, he constructed an actual model of this, a, a kind of physical um, miniature of an economy using these water cisterns. An individual's consumption of commodity is the volume of water that is present in a cistern. Marginal utility is the remaining empty space that is the space left over that isn't consumed by water within the cistern and is diminishing with each subsequent increment in the consumption of the commodity. Since the volume of water is a conserved quantity, one can use a kind of conservation law to describe the dynamics of utility in an economy. Equilibrium of utility is obtained when fluid transfer stops and retains a stable state of some kind. So later on in the dissertation, Fisher makes the literal identification of the sum total of marginal utilities as consumed by an individual with the total work done by a particle in a physical system. So these are direct quotes here. The total work done by a particle in moving from the origin to a given position is the integral of the resisting forces along all space axes multiplied by the distances moved along those axes. The total disutility suffered by an individual in assuming a given position in the economic world is the integral of the marginal disutility along all commodity axes multiplied by the distances moved along those axes. Now, on this particular page in the dissertation 86, he has a table and he draws these direct analogies and identifications between economic concepts and that of physical concepts as well. Okay, so now on to Francis Sidro Edgeworth. Um, so, so Edgeworth ended up reviewing uh, mathematical investigations, that is Fisher's dissertation. Uh, to quote from his review, profoundly impressed with the analogy between mechanical and economic equilibrium, Dr. Fisher has employed the principle that water seeks its level to illustrate some of the leading propositions of pure economics. Edgeworth was, of course, the founding editor of the Economic Journal the same year that Fisher completed his dissertation. Fisher would eventually invite Edgeworth to give lectures at Yale. Um, Edgeworth read very widely, not just in literature, philosophy, and the law, but mainly in physics, too. Fourier's theory of heat, Poisson's mechanics, lots of physics. Uh, Edgeworth's mother, Rosa, was friends with physicist William Rowan Hamilton. 
Uh, following Hamilton's approach to calculating the least action of a physical system, Edgeworth employs the calculus of variations as a means of finding minima and maxima for equilibrium and market exchange in mathematical psychics. So this is Edgeworth's main economics book. Okay, so Edgeworth was a very kind of gifted statistician. Um, he was elected in 1886 as a member of the Council of the Statistical Society of London, later named the Royal Statistical Society. Among other things, he would do a descriptive analysis of the hexameter and dactyl properties of Virgil's Aeneid. Right, so he was trained, uh, if I recall, um, he was studying a lot of classics at the time. Um, and uh, he, he did this very careful analysis of this. Um, he was also involved in inferential statistics. So he constructed these predictive models ranging from the average time it takes for wasps, that is the insect, to perform certain tasks, uh, to the employment of statistical tests via his novel method of fluctuations, which is kind of like uh, estimating means of populations, but not quite. So Stiegler has more details on this in his paper. So again, he would take very seriously models and concepts from physics to the application of economic phenomena. In mathematical psychics, he claimed that the application of hydrodynamics in fluid mechanics could shed light on understanding the uniformity of price in a market that makes markets compete to offer the lowest prices while still retaining a profit. So here are two other quotes here. Pleasure is the concomitant of energy. Energy may be regarded as the central idea of mathematical physics. Maximum energy, the object of the principal investigations in that science. In a later paper in 1884, the field of competition may be compared to a fanciful system consisting of two groups of particles in a plane, each particle tending to its own position of maximum, that is kinetic minimum potential energy. Equilibrium, which is indeterminate in the case of a finite number of particles, becomes determinate in the limit. Okay, so having kind of set up that background for Edgeworth's views on physics, um, I want to talk specifically about scaling laws. So um, Edgeworth and Vilfredo Pareto uh, had a debate on scaling laws in the year 1896. Uh, so over a sequence of papers that were exchanged and debated in two journals, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society and this Italian journal, um, Edgeworth grants that a power law to quote, points to the dependency of the distribution of income upon constant causes not to be easily set aside by hasty reformers. We must be careful of the exact structural details of the relationship between variables. So he would agree generally that there is something like power law. We just need to be careful about the exact details of what that looks like. Um, so here's an example. It, it would be irrational to conclude that the letters in a baby's name uh, causally influence its birth weight, no matter how strong the correlation may be. Uh, so his objection to Pareto at this time was that, well, Pareto, you might have demonstrated an excellent correlation, but if we want to elevate economics to, in some sense, a more rigorous science, that we would need to have something like causal knowledge or something that isn't just merely coincidence or correlation. Okay, so the, the locus of the debate centers on relations of the following form. Log of n equals log of a minus alpha log of x where n is the number of people who have income t greater than or equal to x. Pareto argues that such curves represent the law of total incomes almost the same over an extremely wide range of countries. So if you recall an earlier slide when I talked about um, uh, power laws very briefly, econophysicists also believe in this. Okay, so what are Edgeworth's exact issues with this particular scaling law? Well, as he says, first, this can't be a literally true formula, even if restricted on a certain domain, because there ought to be an infinite number of null outcomes and an indefinitely number of incomes in the neighborhood of zero. So if you kind of think about this for a second, all he's saying is that, well, if x is zero, then n should be infinite. So there should be an infinite number of people um, according, according to this. So that's his first objection. Second is that Edgeworth objects to Pareto's definition of n insofar as the integral of n always diverges for any income of consideration. However, of course, Pareto said that we, well, we should restrict it. You know, we should restrict it to 
um, alpha greater than one, that is going back here, alpha here being greater than one, then it will uh, converge. Edgeworth's idea is that if a social law was ever to be as rigorous as a physical law, then it ought to admit a few, if any, exceptions, at least in this particular debate. So Pareto's response was quite angry. And this is a direct quote, at least from the English uh, translation of the paper that I was reading. <laughs> Where are you off to? I'm selling fish. This is how one might sum up Professor Edgeworth's article. While all living things are absorbed in the supreme trial, you are not ashamed, you miserable pygmy, to devote your attention to the income curve. <laughs> so I don't know if this is just a poor translation. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know enough about Pareto. But this is a very unprofessional comment, of course, as you can imagine, to make in an exchange. So he had very strong views about it. He thought that Edgeworth did not understand what he was talking about. He thought that Edgeworth was making irrelevant criticisms to Pareto's account of scaling law. Right? So Pareto would say there's nothing conceptually or empirically problematic about restricting the domain of any given equation in order to derive meaningful results. Edgeworth had a kind of roundabout way to respond to this. He said, well, compare your model to Pearson's. Uh, that is the famous statistician Carl Pearson. As well as certain forms of the normal distribution would be not only more satisfying from an a priori perspective, but would especially fit the facts of empirically observed data such as housing valuations more accurately than Pareto's curves. So this is me paraphrasing what he's saying here. Um, the third kind of objection that is kind of highlighted throughout these exchanges in this year is um, that uh, Edgeworth reveals his broader philosophical views in science by noting that what is true of natural phenomena is more likely to also be true of social phenomena. Okay, so probability density functions representing normally distributed random variables can model the velocity of moving bodies and they can fit also data for house values and amounts of income as well much better so long as they're properly truncated. <clears throat> also in this sequence of exchanges, Edgeworth would entertain the idea of a universal frequency curve of the following form. So looking at this, um, C here is not supposed to be um, variance. Uh, and so this isn't exactly the normal distribution in the sense of the Gaussian distribution. Um, so to quote from the paper though, he says, a law known to be applicable to the most diverse subjects, not only empirically by observation, but also a priori by mathematical theory, also emphasizing this curve's derivation from something approximating the central limit theory. Okay, so he thinks that this applies to many, many things. Um, Pareto objected that such a distribution would of course have to also be truncated. Um, but Edgeworth would say, well, at least it wouldn't be as ad hoc uh, because it was based upon a combination of not only first principles of math, but also observed values of housing prices and other things <clears throat> that he spoke about earlier. So you might ask, you know, did they, did they agree about anything in this debate? You know, what, what exactly was the problem? So on the one hand, they agreed that there is something like a scaling law, something approaching it, just exact details they're in disagreement about. Um, but more philosophically, they did agree that there is cases of harmony between a priori reasoning and empirical confirmation. So one example given is Newton's uh, demonstration of planets as elliptical, uh, cohering with Kepler's own observational data. Uh, Pareto also agrees with the analogy. But uh, Edgeworth, in a sense, uh, seemed to have more strict concerns, at least, than did Pareto. So to quote Edgeworth in a later paper, I, I believe this is Philosophy of Chance in the journal Mind. According as probabilities are, more fully based on statistical experience, the determination of that degree of probability which it is proper to attach to given evidence approaches the character of objective science. Okay, so how does this relate to econophysics again? Econophysics is largely phenomenological in the sense used of that term in physics. That is, it's, it's data first. 
Statistical and even historical analysis must be drawn upon to dissect regularities in political economy, commenting that it is impossible to overrate the importance of the historical method. So his views were, in some sense, very positivistic, despite what we saw earlier about the a priori first principles styled argumentation. So in a recent econophysics paper, the most significant concept in econophysics, as argued by Jovanovich and Shinkus, is the use of these stable levy processes of the following form. Notice that they also take something similar to a scaling law here. Uh, levy processes can be constructed so as to be stable, that is time invariant, and yet have infinite variance, while nonetheless having empirical support when properly truncated as a regularity in stock market pricing as just one example. Uh, Gabay, who's at Harvard, as this papered, um, power laws of the following form, y equaling ax to the beta, um, he claims are the closest candidate for the existence of non-trivial economic laws. And a lot of his examples involve finance, but he talks about uh, a few other things as well in that paper. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through the last section here. So um, I wanna walk through uh, a kind of more ambitious uh, model uh, that is used in econophysics and that has generated some literature in philosophy of science um, to give you an idea of how contemporary econophysicists use scaling laws in a kind of even more controversial sense. So uh, Jennifer June and uh, some co-authors defend the johansson ledoit sornet model, that's what they call it, which uses concepts from critical phase transitions in physics to predict uh, stock market crashes. So this includes, they claim, U.S. 1929, 1987 crashes, and the Hong Kong crash of 1997. Okay, so the first part of this model posits this log periodic power law, okay? Where a P of T naught is the price at some stipulated initial time, P of T is the price at a subsequent time, K is a constant, H of T is the hazard rate. So the term on the right side of the equation is not a probability density function, because it does not need to sum to one. Rather, it represents the total number of times you should have experienced a crash during this period, supposing the crash were repeatable. Now, God forbid we ever try to repeat crashes, but that's the idea. Uh, H of T is a cumulative distribution function of the system's propensity to crash at or before time T. Okay, so where does the physics come in here? Well, assuming that traders' interactions are representable as a lattice framework, that is buying and selling, one can use the icing model of phase transitions, which is a, a very commonly used model in condensed matter physics. Agents either buy or sell in the same manner that spin is either up or down. That is intrinsic angular momentum for, for example, uh, electrons. In physical the system to be a variable chi defined as the following um, exponential function here with T sub C the critical temperature and gamma a critical exponent. So recall the kind of concerns that Edgeworth and Pareto had about scaling and exponent values in that sense too. The JLS model claims analogously that H of T um, also has a kind of similar exponential law like this, where T sub C is the most probable time for the crash. Uh, since asset prices are particularly volatile as they approach T sub C, um, they claim in their paper that this um, is a better approximation for H of T. So again, this is a part of a family of log periodic power laws that are discussed a lot. Uh, so the key claim here is that the critical exponent gamma in equation chi, going back here, this gamma here, um, is supposed to be one that has a very similar value to that of other equations uh, governing physical phenomena at a different scale. So there's supposed to be something like a scale invariance property. Of course, we don't see any of that in Edgeworth in the Pareto debate. That doesn't exist in that discussion whatsoever. So this is an example of how they've taken scaling law ideas and really run with it now in contemporary econophysics. So that is different levels of scale for a single market crash are supposed to exhibit the same behavior. So here's a example that hopefully is somewhat intuitive. So scrutinizing a volume of liquid we see that it contains bubbles of steam of widely varying sizes in roughly equal proportions. So this is specifically at a certain kind of pressure and temperature. If I recall correctly, it's 374 degrees Celsius. 
And so in roughly equal proportions, scrutinizing such a bubble, we see that it contains yet smaller droplets of water in roughly equal proportions, and so on through many orders of magnitude of size. So there is this scale invariance. When you zoom in, you're still going to get the same kinds of proportions when you zoom in very closely. So a wide variety of physical systems exhibit this scale invariance property. So water is not the only example of this. Um, that is, given the value of some quantity V of Q, where P is the critical exponent, P has a remarkably similar value despite changes in the scale. So I'll give you two examples here. Um, so we have the difference between the densities of liquid water and steam, the average magnetization of a piece of iron. We have uh, measuring the isothermal compressibility of water at a fixed temperature. We have measuring how iron's magnetization changes as a function of an externally applied magnetic field. So if you look at one and two, and you consider V of Q here, the value P has values as close as 0 0.35. So they, they're, they're very similar for both of those kinds of phenomena. Similarly, for three and four, they also have P equaling 1.2. Okay, so just kind of wrapping up here. Uh, there are proto-econophysical ideas in the history of economic thought, not just finance or physics. Uh, Jevons, Fisher, and Edgeworth were not full-fledged econophysicists in the contemporary sense. That is not my claim. Uh, rather, their ideas and theories can be considered as somewhat methodological predecessors to some of the assumptions employed in several recent popular econophysical models. Uh, there's no single school of thought that necessarily unites them, except for the usage of physical models, metaphors, and analogies for the purposes of this talk. So econophysics did not so much merely emerge with no methodological precedence in the 1990s, but was a kind of more gradual development from ideas discussed in this time period. Okay, thank you. Questions? John, over there. Thank you for your interesting and really well done paper. I think your history is a continuity thesis the predecessor's argument. If uh, you look at uh, uh, Jovanovich and, and Shinkus, I think they uh, take econophysics, well, it doesn't, that label, of course, doesn't antedate the more recent history. They take it as a relatively autonomous field to be between physics and economics, really not part of either. So if you distinguish interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, that transdisciplinarity is what they're talking about, the emergence of a relatively autonomous field. Whereas interdisciplinarity, what you've got is borrows that have transfer, transformational effects on a, the borrowing discipline, perhaps even cre creating a subdiscipline. So uh, going back to Camilla's uh, paper about uh, the impact of Copeland's on uh, economics, you've, when you're bringing things in, there's some stuff that can and some stuff that maybe can't come in. And so you would make an argument, perhaps, for econophysics being an autonomous field if there's substantially stuff there that can't really come in. So in other words, there's uh, disciplinary filters or screening that prevents some stuff coming in. So your most powerful components, I think, are the, the power laws and the icing models, the critical phase transitions. And I just think that stuff is hostile to the, the standard neoclassical view of a, an economy that works through equilibrium processes that have a social value interpretation as harmonious world. I mean, after all, with Pareto, if you're going to say that, as, as, uh, as uh, who was the, the guy at Harvard, the French? Uh, uh, Gabay's. Gabay's uh, uh, yeah, he says, well, this is as close to a law as we can get. Forget the law of demand, by the way. <laughs> and because, but what does that law tell us? It tells us society is hierarchical by income groups. As the, so I don't think that economics, even though it has drawn historically on physics, can bring in some of this stuff. So I say discontinuity thesis rather than continuity thesis. Uh, thank you for your comment. That, that's very helpful. Um, so, so that's a good point. I think I need to think more about exactly to what sense it is continuous. Um, and I think that, that those are very good concerns that I need to think about for, for my paper. 
Um, I mean, it's certainly clear that uh, a lot of econophysicists reject um, a lot of central assumptions of uh, neoclassical economics. That's, that's, that's definitely true. Um, so, so, so saying it's continuous in that sense is, is probably, yeah, not, not as correct as, as if I think about it. Um, and uh, I, I mean, so th there's kind of also some work uh, done in the mid, or sorry, more work done recently on the mid 20th century. So um, it was Schinkes who just did his second PhD at, at Cambridge HPS. And um, in his dissertation, which you can see online, he tries to track this to the Santa Fe um, a Complexity Institute there. And he says figures in the 1970s in particular. Also, uh, these are physicists are contributing to the development of econophysics. But again, that's still physicists doing econophysics as opposed to, you know, where does the economics come in in this kind of sense. So um, uh, in, in that sense, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I do need to think more, more carefully about what I'm claiming here when I say it's continuous. And, there is, um, I think Jeff, yeah, okay. Uh, while you're giving him a phone, I'll, I'll uh, Adrian, there is a literature using the term econophysics in the 30s. So, and uh, I was looking for it, but I can't locate it. But I do, I do know that there was a use, a discussion of econophysics in the 30s, and it was by economists. So, so just to clarify, is that the term econophysics? Yes. yes. Really? Yes. Okay, interesting. I hadn't come across it in any of the literature so yes. far. So please do send me the reference yeah. if, you, if you do find it. Yes, um, I, I found the paper thought-provoking, which is a good thing. I wish I had more coherent thoughts that were provoked, but uh, um, I think following on John's comment, I think what is an interesting um, thing to think about is there, there are going to be there are going to be times when the profession as it exists is more receptive or less receptive to these types of arguments, and we want to look at those times and, and see what might be um, going on. And a couple of literatures I thought about. One is the income distribution literature leading up to Mincer's human capital dissertation, which was sort of a replacement with a bot, and he reviews the extant in, you know, so what's the question? The question is how do we explain the distribution of income? And there were a number of what were called statistical models that, you know, posited that what we were looking at were a bunch of particles and the ways that they interacted led to a distribution. And, you know, if you, if you posited the right sort of interaction, then you'd get the right sort of distribution. And these were sort of competing models. And what Mincer said he would do and what he did do um, in opposition to that was to propose behavioral models where the particles were engaged in optimizing behavior. Mm -hmm. And that, that swept away all the old literature, okay, pretty much. So we don't think about income distribution very much in that way anymore. Um, another literature is this literature on Zipf's law of city right, sizes right, that yeah, you yeah. briefly refer to, which also has a scaling yeah. um, element to it because it applies to the towns in a county or the cities in a world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it might be Gabay, but I know some modern um, authors try to explain it with a statistical model. You know, they say there's a um, normal distribution of growth rates rather than growth numbers, and then from that you can do some math and derive this Zipf's law relationship. But it's not a behavioral model because it doesn't posit um, any sort of behavioral you know, optimization behavior generating the distribution of growth rates. But, you know, those are a couple of literatures that, that sound like the kind of, you know, econophysics arguments where we look at the empirical distribution, we try to construct a model of interacting or of something that comes from physics, like a model of interacting particles that will generate the empirical distribution. And so back to, you know, my original thought was, what is it that makes economists more receptive to that type of thing at some time to that type of thing at some times than in others? Just you know something, um, something your paper made me think about, and, and I appreciate that. Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff, for that comment. I, I think it's a great question. That's exactly what I'm interested in too. Um, I, I don't have a clear answer on, on the kind of trends, uh, you know, the up, up, ups and downs, and the kind of usage of physics uh, metaphors in economics. Um, I didn't study economics in undergrad. Um, so I, I don't know much about that, but um, I, I think that's that's a good point. And, and I just want to clarify again. So the the book you mentioned by Mincer, can you say the name again? Oh, this is dissertation. Oh, it's human capital dissertation. Okay. In 1958, it was published then as a series of papers. Okay, I'll I'll have a look at that. Thank you. 
Oh, that was, this is fascinating. Um, I know the names of the people you write about, but not the topics you wrote on. So this is, this is really good for me. Um, one thing that you might think about is from a contemporary point of view, one of Jevons' great claims was as a logician that he's remembered uh, for, for proposing the inclusive or. So this is, this is Jevons's, one of Jevons' contributions, but his, his great book is, is called Substitution of Similars. And so he's got a substitution principle and what shows up in, 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 in political economy by for the law of one price. And that, um, so when he collected his technical papers, he comments on some, on a new, on some new work by McCall. And McCall is vaguely remembered as the first person to, propose a, look, a modern logic with possible in it, not just true false, but also possible. And this is, a, this is of course, before C.I. Lewis, and so. So I just it, want to pause on one second. For McCall, is that the Scottish logician? Is that right? He, um, I, I think I heard of McCall, so he's yeah, supposed it's, to. Yeah, he's a, he's a logician. It's in the London Mathematicals magazine, and so I can, I can okay. uh, when I get home, I'll send you, I'll copy, okay, the, I I'll copy the Jevons Thanks. thing. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, and so, so Jevons makes a really interesting point, and this is why I think it's relevant to your, to your work, and he said, look, McCall is working with beliefs, right? And if you work with beliefs, you can't substitute. This is before Frege, right? This, you can't substitute across belief states. And so we gotta work with things. So we, if we work with things, we can substitute. We can make substitutions. We can't substitute across belief states, and so what this stuff is doing seems to be to moving from belief thingies, which is very much in the Adam Smith worldview, where you you know it's certainly it's in Barclay. It's Barclay's theory of vision is all belief stuff and not physical stuff. That is moving from belief stuff to thing stuff. And with thing stuff, you can substitute similars for it, equals for equals. You can't substitute equals for equals across belief states, which is not, you know, something that Jevons knew. And so I think that this is, so, so one of the ways of thinking about what these folks you're studying are doing is they're going from a world populated by, by believing agents to a, a world where there is no belief. There's just things. But I thought your paper was just, ter just, just terrifically helpful to think about some of the things I read long ago. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, David. Um, so if I understand you, this is a distinction that um, I guess linguists make between intentional versus extensional um, yeah. operators, for example. So I guess the example, if I, if I remember from undergrad, so. Uh, Lois Lane believes Superman can fly, but Lois Lane does not believe that Clark Kent can fly. Okay, so in that sense, that substitution of similars is supposed to be invalid in the case of intentional uh, operators like that, right? Okay, so uh, that's interesting. I, I don't, so I, I see what you're trying to say because at this time, right, I mean, Edgeworth has hedonic calculus. He's interested in, in pleasure. He's interested in pain. He's interested in the utilitarian tradition. You have Jevons who's interested in mental states in that kind of sense. Um, whereas Fisher's like, I, I want none of that. I want to do something different. I want to try to do something more objective in some sense. At least in this dissertation, he, he, he tries to argue for this. And then you see this econophysics stuff. Similarly, they're just denying, they don't care about the mental states of agents. I mean, you get this wild uh, quote. Just want to bring it up again here. Let's see if I can find this real quick. Um, here you go, yeah, Yigorov here, the second bullet point. Economic science may also have a type of Heisenberg inequality because some microeconomic parameters are not observable directly. 
you know, putting aside, in my personal opinion, just complete nonsense about Heisenberg inequality. There's just no relation to quantum mechanics in this. But uh, yeah, so so I, I hear I, that, that's really interesting. I haven't thought about that uh, about to what extent. Um, you know, is there something about these formalisms that is more extensional rather than intentional? With an intention with an S, I mean, uh, as opposed to T. So I that, that's a, I don't know. I have to think about that. Thank thank you. Thanks so much for the paper, which is um, quite interesting. I have a cute comment and a clarification. Um, the cute comment is that you can actually go back to Adam Smith and his study of astronomy and his link between, uh, in a sense, economics and astronomy. It was called the Newton of the moral sciences. Um, and the clarification is actually on Fisher. Um, and how exactly it does it link um, to the theory of money. Can you, you had a, a slide before. Uh, let's see here, so. Uh, oh, so right, right, so. Um, uh, so I mean, he does also talk about, in some sense, uh, so my memory's not so good of the, of the dissertation, but uh, he, he, does, he has this very complicated way to put all these things together, right? He has supply, demand, price, utility, money, and the conservation is really key to the cistern analogy that he uses in his model. And uh, I can't tell you those details right now because I don't remember them. But if you do look at the dissertation, um, he has this, so he has this sequence of um, cisterns, like the, that's what he calls them, these, these vessels containing water, and they're connected by tubes. And he, again, he constructed a, an actual model of this at Yale that he even showed to his undergraduate students at one point. And he has this mechanism where you have this stopper. Um, so if you can just imagine a kind of vial with a, a cork um, cylinder extending maybe a few inches down. And if you push this, the, the stopper down, that actually increases the water levels, right? And so similar, it's supposed to be like a, like a, you know, increase of consumption of a commodity or something, but he has all these other analogies and it's kind of uh, difficult to follow because he's, he's really, it's a kind of creative exercise, this dissertation, more than a kind of super rigorous in my opinion. And so, uh, yeah, on those details, I, I don't remember exactly, but I can tell you that much about the cistern model. So I guess what I was more curious about is what kind of money is he actually considering? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by what kind Where does of money, money come from? Uh, what can money increase? Can money decrease? Who is? Oh, the, I see. The where oh, is? Okay. Where does money come from? What's the source of money? Are banks present? Is credit present? Yes. So that's a good question. I, I admit I don't remember exactly. But it, and it, he's not necessarily making exactly the same kind of conservation claim as the more wild claim from Yakovenko is. Uh, in that sense, uh, it, 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 that's maybe a disanalogy in that sense, to clarify that. That much I can tell you, but the other details I'd have to look again. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for this paper. Uh, when I think of econophysics, and I, you know, Murawski was important to me uh, a long while ago, but I think of formalisms heavily dictating, you know, our conceptions of the economy and so forth. And yet you have, at the very beginning, this very interesting statement about how the phenomenological, data-first, positivist approach is very much where econophysics is these days. Yes, very um, much so. Can you say more about what that looks like within physics? So I'm not a physics student, but I can, I can tell you what I, what I do know a bit more about that. Um, so um, I did take a course on philosophy of physics, and one thing we talked about is quantum field theory. And so quantum field theory, as I understand it, um, there's cases where, um, so you have these kind of infinite, you have these diverging uh, infinite sums, um, and the question is, uh, what kind of, what, how do you truncate it so you get empirically meaningful results? Um, and so in these kinds of cases, they're not starting, I mean, so, you know, quantum field theory is kind of based off of aspects of special relativity and uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics combined in this sense. Um, but in, in this kind of approach, I mean, it's supposed to be uh, data first in, in some sense because, uh, you know, your initial assumptions are leading to absurd results. And so there's a lot of controversy as to the uh, consistency of the foundations of quantum field theory in this sense. And, uh, and the data first approach, again, is supposed to be, well, how, how do we truncate exactly? And in order to do that, you have to focus on the data first as opposed to just taking a more um, uh, 
kind of deductive view. Because in, in um, non-relativistic quantum mechanics for the kind of, uh, you know, the Dirac notation, all this kind of stuff, the, bra the bracket notation, um, this kind of approach is uh, a lot more secure as I understand it. So you can make, um, it, it's fairly robust and you can kind of, uh, you know, sh show that certain things will fall from it without having to consult the data. You can predict uh, much better in that kind of sense. Um, but again, I'm not a physics student, so I can't. I don't want to comment any further on that. That's helpful what you said. Sorry. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Yes. But I, I know that much about the quantum field theory situation. Uh, thank you. Really interesting uh, paper. And <clears throat> so I had um, a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one would be like: uh, so you seem to imply that? Uh, well, actually, you argue, not imply that. Um, Econophysics have like a long history, basically, yeah, dating back at least like 100 or more uh, years ago. Uh, so did you find any evidence that, you know, why, any explanation for why it didn't take hold in the discipline that much? Uh, you know, maybe there was, maybe you came across some kind of particular kind of stuff that uh, prevented it to become more mainstream uh, back in the day. Uh, that's one question. Uh, the other question, um, is there any like uh, a short, concise statement of like declaration or proclamation of iconophysicists uh, that states why it is better than, you know, other types of um, econometrics or economic science? Um, and uh, the third question is, um, so I, as far as I know, one of the criticisms uh, of, uh, of methods, of bringing methods from natural sciences to social sciences is that uh, they are reductionists, uh, basically. Um, and, uh, and the other point normally uh, is that if you, so if you basically, uh, uh, take the view that natural that social phenomena is explained by natural phenomena, then you cannot do anything about it because it's simply governed by by some natural laws, and we just sit back and you know observe, and that's it. And then we can't do anything. So, and then what's the point? You know. Um, so, I mean, I, I would like to uh, hear your response or the response of the people in the field uh, to those um, questions, if possible. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll try to take that in reverse order. I'm sorry, I forgot the first question. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. Sure. So the re reductionism, uh, look, so that's interesting, right? So according to at least one account in philosophy of science of laws of nature, there are things that we can't change. Uh, and so if it's true that a social system is, in a sense, purely natural in the way that some economists claim to, to treat it as such, then in what sense can we intervene on, on the system in a way that can you know, solve wealth inequality or any of the kinds of things that these people are interested in solving? Um, I mean, I don't know if I would quite draw that conclusion. I mean, I mean, this gets into, you know, these debates in free will in metaphysics class in undergrad, you know, I mean, if you, even if everything's determined, doesn't mean you should just kill yourself or something. I mean, so it's not clear to me that just because nature governs everything that there's no meaningful um, and semantically clear sense of choice. I mean, I make choices, I'm gonna pick this up right now, even if I'm governed by laws of physics. And so, you know, you don't need to be a defender of, of necessarily some radical Christian conception of free will to, to have to, 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 with regards, yeah. So, so with regards to the, that, uh, that's what I'd have to say about that. So re reductionism, um, so I, I mean, that's, that's definitely true. A lot of these, I mean, you saw from this JLS model, for example, this critical phase transition models, they do take this idea that um, economic agents are in some sense, uh, their belief states are completely irrelevant. Uh, they can be reduced to this very radical, wild uh, icing model of spins, uh, spin being up or spin down in accordance with buying or selling. And that, I mean, that's highly reductionistic, absolutely. So I think across the board, I mean, if you read some of the recent econophysics uh, books that have come out, these are like essentially textbooks, they take a very similar kind of reductionistic approach in that sense. And uh, sorry, what was your first question? Did I, did I Prevented this uh, uh, this uh, um, the kind of physics uh, from becoming like more more mainstream uh, because it apparently it started like long time ago according to the paper right so 
why didn't it become more kind of well, so, right, I mean, to clarify, I do not claim that there's a quantum physics in the, in the sense now that there was back then. I'm just saying that there's predecessors to some of the methods and some of the, the key ideas. Uh, so in that sense, I do not claim that a quantum physics as practiced now is, is kind of alive and well at any period prior to uh, the 1990s. I was just trying to give a account of methodological origins in some sense. I mean, if you look at... Uh, uh, Jovano, Frank Jovanovich's work. So Frank Jovanovich has papers talking about Jules Renault back to 1836. So he tried to use um, something like uh, non-Gaussian distributions to model stock option prices, for example. And so uh, Jovanovich has an argument that, uh, you know, this is going along the historiographic view that Icon of physics is more tied to history of finance. And so in that sense, you can look at his work and, and track that kind of stuff. I have less interest in that. I'm not as interested in the finance angle. I was just curious to try to dig up um, similarities uh, in, in e economics, more mainstream economics, uh, and to what extent uh, there might have been methodological precedent set by some figures in econophysical physical ideas. That was the only attempt in my paper to try to do. Let's thank Adrian. <laughs> the, the, 